I introduced myself earlier, but just to repeat, my name is Mark Phillips. Um, I currently have kind of two hats. So I work um, at a little research center at McGill University in Montreal called the Center for Genomics and Policy, where uh, I kind of act in my capacity as a lawyer, but it's more actually uh, in an academic context there. Um, so I'll, I do a lot of writing on kind of cutting edge uh, genomic uh, health research, uh, data sharing, especially I'm kind of the main um, privacy and data protection person there. And so I'm doing a lot of stuff around that, but also some other ethical and legal issues. Uh, and then I'm also uh, have another hat where I'm a practicing lawyer. And so I um, advise clients on uh, especially privacy data protection issues, including uh, you know, people in the field, including, you know, rare, rare disease patient advocacy organizations on compliance issues like, uh, you know, putting together a privacy policy, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but I have a former life also as a um, software developer. I have a computer science background as well. So I kind of have my hats or my, I have, you know, I kind of in two different fields at once, but I don't have as much formal background actually in life sciences. So it's probably very different. It sounded like from the introduction, most of you are, you know, researchers or uh, in medicine, etc. Uh, but since things are so interdisciplinary kind of these years and things are coming together, it seems that uh, kind of a variety of backgrounds is, is helpful. Um, so that's a bit about me. What we're going to be talking about here is, of course, uh, you know, legal ethical frameworks. And because you're, you know, researchers, scientists, uh, you know, healthcare practitioners, etc., obviously you're not going to be experts in uh, legal compliance, but it's good, I think, at least uh, to kind of supplement what you know with being able to kind of flag issues when they arise, uh, seek out, uh, you know, more advice and help, and be able to generally think about how we kind of structure these ideas. Um, so just to talk a bit about the kind of cloud context, this is a bit more the technological context to start. So as you may know or may not know, there's been kind of a, an increasing interest in turning to to the cloud in uh, genomic research, life sciences, et cetera. And so in Europe, um, there's a, a relatively recent project called the Open Science Cloud that they're trying to put together different in infrastructures across the, the, um, across the continent to, to serve science. Uh, I'm not sure if it came up already earlier today, but out of Chicago, uh, NCI has got its gen genomic data commons. And then similarly, um, and I believe this is a platform we're gonna be working with all week here, uh, the Cancer Genome Collaboratory uh, is another kind of cloud um, project uh, based, essentially, I mean, it's a collaboration, but it's basically based out of, uh, out of Toronto. Um, and so there's some specific um, <coughs> considerations that come out in the cloud. I'll list kind of, kind of the intro to, intro to cloud stuff, as people may already be aware. So what, first of all, kind of what is the cloud when we're talking about it? Uh, the characteristics, it's kind, of, it's kind of set off against traditional uh, approaches to computing in terms of, you know, buying your own machine or using an academic computing center that might have quite a bit of power. But the idea here is, um, so on-demand self-service is kind of the first characteristic. The idea is you can kind of go onto Amazon Web Services, buy whatever you want, have it instantly without having to call anyone and talk to them on the phone. Uh, broad network access so that you can kind of access the resource from wherever you are. You don't have to be physically close to it, uh, usually on the open internet. Uh, resource pooling is kind of maybe the main characteristic. And so this is kind of the idea that the servers are, the resources you're using are out there somewhere, probably in a server farm. It doesn't matter so much to you generally where, they, uh, where those uh, servers are, how they're working. Uh, and through essentially virtualization, we can, you know, file, fire up virtual machines with our desired environment wherever you are. Um, uh, at, at some point, some of these things break down, and we do start to care that we'll, we'll talk about a, a bit more later about where the servers are located. Um, rapid elasticity is the kind of fourth characteristic, the idea that we can scale up our projects really quickly. Um, and so, you know, the ideas are here. And generally, the idea here is uh, the traditional approach would be if you have a project, you've got to actually buy the hardware or have the hardware around. Uh, here, we can kind of scale up and scale down as need be to, in theory, at least keep costs um, you know, tailored to the project we're working on. Uh, and the last characteristic is kind of measured service. So the idea is you're paying for, you know, whatever, you know, amount of processing you're using, what storage, memory, et cetera, uh, and not more. Um, you know, often, we often talk about a few different service models um, when it comes to the cloud. And so uh, infrastructure as a service is kind of the most low level one where you're essentially buying, uh, you know, processing power, memory, uh, or, or kind of raw um, raw storage, et cetera. And the other kind of extreme uh, would be software as a service, kind of things when we were using essentially, you know, things like Gmail uh, uh, or any kind of end, end user application. It's 
all the work happens in the cloud, but it's kind of transparent to us. We just fire up a browser. And then the in-between kind of middle ground is more, I think, like, uh, I'd be interested to hear from others, if uh, other instructors, if they agree, but I think what we're looking at with something like the Cancer Genome Collaboratory, something more like platform as a service where, uh, you know, you can fire up virtual machines, et cetera, but there's a lot of uh, kind of uh, analytic tools that are built in there, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of repetitive tasks that are essentially we avoid um, rather than having to build something up ourselves from scratch. Um, a few other kind of buzzwords that come around the cloud. We talk about the public uh, like public cloud or private cloud, which might be kind of, in some way, especially public cloud, might be the reverse of what you'd expect. Normally when we think of public, we're thinking of often the state uh, owning something and private being uh, corporations. And here it's somewhat reverse where public cloud when we're talking about that it generally will, will refer to so amazon web services for example which is or i shouldn't specifically talk about them any kind of um public cloud service or cloud service provider you're talking about the, the services are essentially assess, accessible to the public anyone can kind of sign up whereas a private cloud generally we're talking about cloud infrastructure within a specific organization um community cloud is kind of similar it's the idea is uh, a group of organizations might might set up um, something together. And you could think of kind of these two as being similar to the collaboratory idea. Part of the reason was that uh, it's nice for researchers to have uh, a cloud infrastructure, a cloud environment, and especially the, the ethical legal considerations tailored to their own needs rather than uh, always relying on kind of a stock out of the box uh, approach, which might not work as well for a specific context. And hybrid cloud, as you might imagine, incorporates elements of, um, of the different earlier deployment models. So how does this look in practice? Um, we're seeing kind of more and more kind of centralization of genomic data because of its huge value. And we might see, for example, um, uh, this is especially a slide about how uh, the, the idea behind the Cancer Genome Collaboratory is, is imagined. Um, and so we might see a whole bunch of genomic data stored from um, uh, patients or participants in North America, but there might, we also, might also have separate clouds in different parts of the, the world. Uh, and some of the reasons for these might be technological, but often they're actually ethical legal considerations. There's more and more concern about if we're sharing mass amounts of data. I mean, this, this especially came out kind of, uh, I guess it's now seven years ago, following kind of the Snowden revelations. There was, there was concerns about what's going into specifically the U.S., but there started to be concerns kind of everywhere. Uh, how's it being used? Do we, do we lose control over it when, it's, uh, when our data is sent to some other part of the world? And so the idea I think here is that there might be some um, inescapable amount of fracturing of these, of these clouds around the world, but from a researcher's perspective, and this is kind of uh, based around the ICGC, uh, International Cancer Genome Consortium project, um, it, it's nice to be able to have a kind of unified view if we're running analytics, to be able to not have to so much worry about gathering data from all the world, all over the world even when we want to run kind of robust uh, analytics on various cohorts at the same time. And so what we're aiming for here is to, is, uh, you know, to have, to have these kind of prepackaged tools that I was kind of talking about before. Um, and then of course, um, some of the cohorts you're going to require, um, data access committee authorization. So if people are familiar with kind of the research ethics process, there's a, a similar, um, but different, uh, process that's kind of emerged in this new space uh, of the access committee approval. So the idea is you'll get authorizations based on your project from um, the the various cohorts. Here, we, ICGC has actually done a really good job of unifying these down to uh, kind of two separate authorizations, one from TCGA in the U.S., another one from ICGC's DACO generally. Uh, so there aren't a whole pile of authorizations to get. Uh, and the idea is that uh, the researcher wants to be able to pretty easily run kind of a basic analytics uh, across all these. So same thing, for example, run this analytic pipeline across all donors with primary metastatic uh, data, tumor data available. Uh, and so this is essentially what we're aiming for. Um, I've got a bit of an uh, older graphic here that's intending to show kind of the benefits of the cloud versus even kind of a, a combination of academic data compute centers based on just kind of the raw um, amount of data we're dealing with here, the need for, for large cohorts, the size of genomic data in, in many contexts. Um, the theory was that things were going to be um, cheaper, essentially faster and better in the cloud. I think it's taken slightly slower to get there, but I think that's the, the trajectory we're seeing, um, or slower than we, we expected maybe uh, five years ago when we were starting, but it's, it seems to be the, the direction that things are moving. 
Uh, and so it may have already been discussed. I believe this week where uh, the, the infrastructure the things are being based on here uh, is the OpenStack kind of cloud infrastructure, um, which is kind of consistent with the uh, you know open data, open science, um, open source um, ethos of the whole sector and of uh, bioinformatics.ca in particular. So that's kind of some of the, some of the rapid technological background. Um, so now for the second part uh, of my presentation, jumping into uh, some of the kind of landscape of the privacy and ethics issues um, when using genomic data. Yeah, go for it. So, um, this whole uh, the access control, access data, the requirement of uh, a committee to oversee your application. I mean, like you mentioned, you can see it's done differently than a lot of other groups. Yeah. But the rest, all the other groups, and there's a lot of, I mean, just TCGA is another set that people apply for. Exactly. exactly. Is that all of that? Is that scalable? I mean, will there be, I sort of meant the same question I asked Trevor earlier. In the sense that if each project requires a committee to look at the people that want to look at the data, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's not going to work anymore. Yeah, so there's, I think there's kind of two, from what I've seen, there are two kind of overarching responses to that issue. You know, if, because, because, of, because this field is so kind of increasingly internationally collaborative and dealing with different groups and cohorts, and if you have everyone in some degree, it's to be expected that different parts of the world are going to have different ethical, legal concerns and issues, and they might. But if everyone's, you know, uh, consent form looks slightly different, it becomes tricky when you're trying to say some everyone using the data has to um, comply with the original consent. And so there's kind of two approaches I've seen at least put out there. The one that I think I've seen mostly in practice is the ICGC one of just finding a way, uh, doing a lot of work on the back end to be able to centralize and have one DAC. Uh, that even if there are a whole bunch of member projects within ICGC, um, to be able to have kind of one centralized place you can go to to get your authorization, fill out one pretty quick and simple application Wait, you form. Know, you know the Epigenome project, they have seven DACs there. Yeah, and so, so that's the thing we're trying to avoid. That's not the most complicated one, but that's a pretty complicated exactly. one access to one data set. The other approach that's, I mean, I haven't actually seen this in practice, but what's been <laughs> talked about a lot of people have been trying to get off the ground is some kind of um, interoperability or, or almost a federated DAC system where you kind of have one, one DAC and then mini DACs and you try to figure out uh, ways, for to trust each other. By, ways for them to trust each other, ways to code the consent so you can understand, you know, say you want to, say you're using data for a specific purpose, a way to add to your query which data has been consented for the purpose I want, draw all that data in. Uh, I haven't saw, it doesn't make uh, it doesn't make as much sense to me, but I've seen some approaches proposed using like, blockchain somehow to do this because we have to use blockchain for everything. Uh, but I have so far haven't seen in practice um, that kind of. I, mean, I think it's on the horizon, and we'll see if one we'll see if when it comes out whether it's. I have a solution. Okay. <laughs> to this problem, and it's basically it's a trusted scientist status. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not. It's not my It's been talked about by other people, but I agree. And, and sort of the people that sort of cross the border between Canada and the U.S. is like a nexus card for scientists. Mm. And so once you get those, then you have access to all the data sets because you know you're a trusted. We know you're a trusted scientist. You're not going to do anything bad with the data, and you're going to and you're tracking it because you know who you are. Mm -hmm. Because the tracking system, so you can see who has access to the data, mm -hmm. and you know that uh, they're publishing and they're citing the references. And so, so you can have all that. In but having a, a general, generic, trusted scientist status to allow, you know, give me access to all the controlled access data in the world. And it's, it's I know, it's really, you, you give me the same look that Mark gave me. <laughs> <laughs> I think there would be some challenges there. It, it's, um, it's not without challenges. Or, or you might be able to do it, but it would be hard, it would, the bar would be high to get, you know, access to every perspective data set that could be out there. I'm told you're running out of time. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, well, we can take it up in discussion if there's time, et cetera. But so, um, as people may or may not be aware, there's been, I mean, this is going back a few years, but there's been a large number of, especially in the healthcare setting, a large number of breaches and concerns that have been, in, that existed in the media, much, much less in the research context, like uh, very, I mean, the, 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 I don't know if I would call them breaches, but the, the concerns that I've read about, especially in the research context, are more... Uh, thankfully, I think more theoretical breaches where other researchers 
we'll, we'll try to say re-identify participants in a cohort. I'll get to this more later. Uh, and we'll, we'll be able to say, you know, we weren't trying to do anything malicious, but we were able to we were able to kind of undo the security practices you put in place. You should probably consider putting in stronger uh, protections. But in healthcare, it's been quite quite large, especially in parts of the U.S., but all over. And there's been kind of a variety uh, of forms of breaches that you'll see, not all of which are as concerning as others. So you can see things like, uh, and it's not, not clear you'd even call this a breach, things like a denial of service attack in some cases, where it's just flooding the person's or the organization's network so they can't actually use their um, resources in the way and the degree they want, which can be frustrating to people involved uh, and really kind of paralyze the project, but is, has fewer, I mean, or at least different legal concerns. Um, I don't know if people have read about a couple of years ago, there was an explosion of ransomware attacks where essentially it's similar where you, there's usually your data isn't compromised. No one else has access to it, but it's compromised in the sense that it's suddenly encrypted uh, and some malicious actor is asking you to pay a ransom to be able to read your own data back again. And a number of large institutions um, have been kind of hit by these. Um, uh, unauthorized access, is, of course, is kind of a, uh, a large one. Uh, we'll be talking about some of those a bit later. Uh, and then some of the re-identification stuff that I was mentioning will also come up again. Um, so just to go over a quick, quickly a bit some of the overarching like legal and ethical frameworks um, that are kind of at play here. Um, I'm not sure if people have, I'm not sure to what degree people have looked at or worked with these before or if people have a sense of, I've kind of grouped them here into three overarching kind of categories. Um, but I'm not sure if people have an idea of kind of what, you know, legally um, prevents one as a researcher or a, a clinician, et cetera, from doing kind of whatever they want with their data. If people have ideas about things that might be governing what they're doing. So HIPAA definitely is one. Uh, that'll come actually under like the second category of things that I've mentioned here. This is a US law. I'll talk about it a bit more um, later. But so, was there an answer over here too? We, we have IRB institutions that do for free. Basically, they have to prove the research protocol and you can't Outside of this. Yeah, exactly. So that's, I mean, that's the first category I've kind of put up here is a broad kind of research ethics uh, kind of category. So the IRB is especially the U.S. kind of terminology. Um, and in Canada, uh, the main kind of document that people see is, if, I don't know if people have heard of the Tri-Council Policy Statement, which is so a document put out by the three kind of research funding bodies here in Canada. Uh, people here, I assume, would mostly be going either through uh, CIHR, Canadian Institutes for Health Research, or NSERC, the second, and probably less so social sciences and human humanities research, but uh, that council. Um, but in theory, this policy applies to all research. So it's not, it's very, very much not specific to genomic research. The considerations might be different, um, but generally this is what's applied. Specific institutions might have their own kind of... Um, yeah. Um, and so in, in the analog in the U.S. would be more the, the common rule, um, which is a similar kind of, um, you know, it's a, in there it's more of a law rather than a, uh, than a policy um, guiding kind of what they call human subjects research. There's also some kind of common law duties. And I mean, I'm from, uh, you know, from Quebec where the common law is not actually applied in this context. But in most jurisdictions that we're going to be talking about, uh, there's some common law duties that apply. Um, in research specifically, so for example, there's duties to disclose to, to uh, participants and be transparent with them, um, but also even in terms of the kind of way informed consent works, um, the way the common law tends to interpret it, which is a bit interesting from our perspective again, is that if you fail to uh, give full informed consent to research participants, then, then their consent to research uh, you know, was, was not proper. And you've essentially committed the tort of battery, which is almost the similar, the analogy in the kind of private law to criminal law of assault, um, which is going to be less relevant to us, right, when we're working in this data, data sphere. We're not actually physically intervening on participants or patients. We're using secondary use of data. So some of these, some of these um, kind of frameworks are going to apply less or at least less clearly in our context. Um, the second category I put up here is the one that, that HIPAA that was mentioned before falls under, and so it's and it's going to apply somewhat more directly to the kind of the data driven research, but it, and it, but it's really this is a, a, a kind of a field that's really on the rise right now. Although it's, although it's existed since about 1970, you can pretty much pinpoint it to that year. Uh, and so, personal information and data protection law in the U.S. and sometimes in Canada, it's often just called privacy law. In in Europe, there's a much more clear distinction between data protection law and privacy. Um, 
But so in, in the EU, the big um, kind of piece of legislation that's come out, I'm not sure if people would have heard of it, is called the General Data Protection Regulation. Uh, made pretty big waves when it came fully into force last year. If people got, I, I'm not sure if they remember back this far, but in May of 2018, you probably got like a million privacy update notices from all the companies you were working with. It was the, corresponding with the date that this, this was entering fully into effect and companies were kind of panicking. Um, HIPAA was just mentioned, which is a U.S. specific law that's specific to the healthcare sector. And so it, it, some, it has ripples of effects on research, but it primarily targets kind of the healthcare context. Uh, and in Canada, we've got a bit of a weird situation where things are really broken down jurisdictionally and it can get quite confusing because uh, each province kind of has their own, not only does each province have their own often uh, data protection law, but it's also subdivided into private sector versus public sector. So it's quite different than in, in Europe where, uh, you know, there's one law for pretty much the whole continent. Here in a single country, you've got a whole bunch of, uh, of laws that are relevant. The main one, or a main one, it's hard to say the main one, uh, is PEPIDA, which I'm not sure if people would have heard of. It's the Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act. Um, but it's kind of the federal um, private sector law. So any private sector organization, my assumption is that OICR here would fall under PEPIDA, although I'm not 100% sure. I'd have to talk to their in-house counsel about that. Um, but so the idea is that if you're in the private sector rather than the public sector and to add an additional wrinkle, uh, here in Canada, provinces have the kind of ability to adopt their own um, data protection laws and that are deemed to be substantially similar, and then they can override PEPIDA. So far, I think it's just Quebec, uh, Alberta, and BC that have done that in an overarching way. Um, in the in the private, or sorry, public sector, so some universities, for example, uh, McGill University, where I'm out of, is, are subject instead to there it's not actually called FIPA, but uh, in other provinces it's often the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. So you can see the kind of privacy context there. And then just to add another wrinkle, we've got often another set outside of both the kind of private and public sector. We've often, many provinces also have health information protection laws. So in Ontario, for example, uh, people might be familiar with uh, FIPA, the Personal Health Information Protection Act. And these kind of throw things into even more confusion because they usually apply often to, so they'll often be kind of overriding some of the public sector um, context because they're applying to hospitals and things like that. But here FIPA, they basically define, uh, you can see section three here is health information custodian. And they basically list a long list of various people in both public and private sector who are, um, uh, who are subject to this act and then not subject to the other acts. So it can be, so whatever project you're kind of involved in or whatever institution you're working on behalf of, it's good to first kind of figure out um, which law applies to you if you're in Canada or in general. Um, and then although the, the duties, although they're not identical, obviously, they're not the same laws, there, there is a large amount of overlap in the way they, they look and think and feel. And even between these two areas, so kind of the hallmarks of research ethics uh, often are thinking about informed consent, thinking about whether you're doing human subject research or not. If you're not doing human subjects research, you don't generally have to comply with research ethics duties, although uh, there's some exceptions to that. But from our purposes, that's kind of what we're thinking about. Um, and interestingly, actually, um, I mean, we'll maybe get to this later, but uh, under, I mentioned the common rule in the US, uh, until recently, and I think maybe even now, if you're working with what they call de-identified uh, data, even if it's genome, even if it's rich genomic data, uh, a lot of the IRBs in the US would say you're actually not doing human subjects research because you can't identify the humans involved and therefore you're not subject to review. Uh, it seems like that may be changing in the future, but uh, perhaps not yet. Uh, the last kind of big grouping I've put here is basically uh, kind of a contractual obligation. So when you get approval from these, these DACs, the data access committees, you generally have to sign a legally binding agreement. Often your institution will have to sign off um, to show someone uh, is going to be kind of responsible in the event something goes wrong. Uh, and those contracts will kind of add other kind of legally binding obligations on you that, uh, that su supplement essentially or are also sometimes similar to the other obligations that exist. Um, so one question you might have is if we're, you know, for bioinformatics.ca, why are we talking about um, things like the EU General Data Protection Regulation or even HIPAA in the US, it's because there's like not only a huge indirect influence, but increasingly I think there's, there's legal structures are really struggling with the fact that um, traditionally you could 
kind of piece things off into jurisdictions, but with a global internet and international collaboration, it's increasingly hard to do that, and it's tough to see ways around. So this is Article 3 of the Europe's General Data Protection Regulation, and it talks about wh who the, the law applies to. Uh, and so what we see is that, uh, so processing personal data uh, of data subjects who are in the European Union by a controller who's not in the European Union, so basically anywhere else in the world, uh, will still be, this law says, subject to the, the GDPR if they're offering goods or services to these people or if they're monitoring people's behavior. Uh, and so it's, this law is interesting in that it says we can apply to you even if you're sitting you know, in Toronto, uh, if you're offering goods or services to uh, Europeans or if you're monitoring their behavior on a sig sufficient scale. So if someone just shows up you know, at a hotel in downtown Toronto who's European, they're not automatically subject to the GDPR. But in any case, um, because this law, the idea was it applied, it's a general data protection regulation that applies to public, private sector. It's mostly thinking about, you know, it's probably thinking about the kind of tech giants context. It's not thinking about the research context. You can immediately start to ask yourself, well, is, is a research project offering goods or services or is it monitoring people's behavior? Um, and the current thinking is normally, especially if you're getting the data transferred, no. But because of all these kind of difficulties and the, the um, kind of application of... Um, this law um, kind of extraterritorially. I've been involved with some others through a project called the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health that people might be familiar with who have a variety of areas. They work on some kind of uh, data security uh, standards, also kind of other kind of uh, you know, genomic file type standards, but I'm more involved in the ethical legal side. And so we've been trying to uh, clarify some of the issues and we started this series last year of uh, monthly briefs uh, aimed at the research area to try to explain some of the basic ideas. Um, and so one of the one of the briefs that was put out by kind of the co-chair of the this project uh, along with me, uh, Edward Dove, was to say who does the GDPR apply to. Uh, I mean he, he worded it in the more probably appropriate grammatical way. Um, but um, essentially what it seems like from what we can tell, because we don't have a lot of case law about this, is that offering goods or services or that other category I, I mentioned before um, doesn't probably apply in the research context, but there's another article that essentially says if you're collaborating with people, some of whom are inside the European Union, some of whom are not, uh, the, the GDPR probably does apply to you. Uh, and so in a context like the ICGC, which um, you know is a, the project I keep coming back to that the uh, Cancer Genome Collabor Collaboratory is heavily uh, connected to, we do have projects all around the world uh, including in Europe, and so it seems likely in these contexts that the GDPR would ultimately apply. Uh, from the Canadian context, one way to comply more easily if you're receiving data from Europe is um, essentially when it's the predecessor to the GDPR was set up in 1995, uh, they said, you know, you, there was a, essentially a blanket prohibition on transferring data outside of Europe because they were worried about what might happen there, but they said, we still want data to flow freely, so different um, countries around the world can actually have their legal, uh, legal frameworks uh, certified by us as being uh, adequate. And so PEPIDA, the, the Canadian law I mentioned before, actually early on, uh, about 20 years ago now, was approved as adequate by the EU. So if you're receiving data from Europe uh, and you're subject to PEPIDA here in the US, there's, a similar, there's another mechanism in the US um, called the uh, the EU-US uh, Privacy Shield that works in a somewhat similar way. You essentially have satisfied the, your, the, or at least the sender from Europe has satisfied their obligations under the GDPR. So one thing to keep in mind. Uh, I want to jump now to some of kind of the concerns of why we why we care about this, especially so in the cloud context. Um, when we first started talking about the cloud a few years ago, one of the, some of the concerns were things about. Uh, losing data control because the, you're sending the data out somewhere else, someone else is kind of controlling it on your behalf instead of it's not in, on your computer anymore. Uh, so one of the ways this, this manifests itself is uh, in terms of having to sign standard form contracts, especially if it's with some of the large cloud service providers. Uh, sometimes the, the terms, especially the larger the provider, are going to be probably less and less favorable to you. Um, they're uh, often uh, is even, it goes to the degree where they say we can unilaterally change the terms of this contract just by notifying you and you can't really say anything about it other than kind of ending the contract right there. Uh, early on there were some bigger kind of genomics projects <clears throat> that were able to somewhat negotiate um, specific, specific versions of their own 
uh, terms of service. It's tougher and tougher to do now, although there is more and more flexibility in terms of the out of the box um, kind of forms of agreements you can have with cloud service providers now. So for example, generally they'll allow you to say that you only will allow data to be stored in one specific region of the world and not have it processed or stored elsewhere if, if there's legal restrictions that prevent you from doing so. Um, in some cases, there's risk of data loss. We saw this early on, especially with some of the smaller cloud service providers who either went out of business or just weren't protecting their data properly, which can cause huge problems for people if they're relying on that data to be there. Um, in some cases, the, the contracts are also pretty unfavorable as far as who is liable when something goes wrong. Often a lot of the liability is put onto the, the client rather than uh, the cloud service provider. And then especially going back to the, the 2012 uh, Snowden revelation era, there was worries about essentially, you know, Edward Snowden revealing that a lot of these uh, companies were essentially handing over a lot of the data to the government. And there's been some um, ways to, or mechanisms to mitigate this that have come into place since then. Um, I'll go over these quickly because I'm sure people are kind of aware of them, but there's certain harms to the, the data subjects or the, you know, participants or patients. So one thing that comes up a lot is the risks of discrimination in insurance and employment. People might be familiar with, there's a law designed to protect this in the U.S. called GINA, uh, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, that essentially says that, uh, or at least limits the ways that ins insurers and employers can insist on collecting uh, genomic data, that they, they can use it, etc. Uh, in Canada, we've kind of been an outlier in terms of being one of the only uh, countries that are heavily involved in genomic research that haven't had a law like this. There actually, there was one passed uh, at the federal level a few years ago now, but more recently, just in the last few months, there was a case that went to the Quebec Court of Appeal and they decided that the law was unconstitutional for more of a technical issue of uh, division of powers. So the federal parliament in Canada had put this law into place and they said actually the provinces, I mean, I'm oversimplifying quite a bit, but they essentially said this was within the provincial jurisdiction, federal government didn't have the right to do this. And so it becomes more difficult to see uh, if we, especially if we want to reinsure participants or reassure participants that their data won't be misused um, if data is shared widely. Because um, I think it's, I think it's reasonable to expect that if insurers can use this data to try to make uh, predictions and uh, there's nothing to prohibit them from doing so, they generally will. Um, so in Canada, there's still a bit of a, um, a gap there. Um, there's also risks of disclosing sensitive health information. Um, and so um, there can be things like through genomic data of people's susceptibility to disease, but also if people's data is stored in terms of, you know, say a case control kind of context, you can know uh, you, you can disclose kind of who's, who's a case, who has a certain disease, and who doesn't. Uh, paternity information, this kind of came up early in the genomic uh, research years of be, being surprised about um, uh, paternity in specific cases, which can, uh, you know, cause people distress. Um, in some cases, this may be getting more, more theoretical, but uh, the risk is that uh, there could be identity theft, especially if genomics begin or biometrics begin to be used, or genomics uh, begin to be used as a bi biometric identifier. Uh, but generally, um, well, I'll skip to future uses here. Generally, I think that one of the risks too, even if uh, things have certain things haven't materialized yet, is that so unlike say if someone's credit card number, if it gets uh, compromised, there can be you know significant risks or some other kind of financial information that can come to a person. Uh, but ultimately, you can always cancel your credit card, get a new credit card. Uh, if your genomic information um, is somehow breached, there's, you can't really, you know, order a new a new set of DNA or chromosomes, etc. So, uh, if there are future things that can be done with the data, it's kind of uh, you know you can't unring the bell. Uh, and then the last kind of set of uh, potential risks are to researchers, and so uh, there's of course the risk that. Uh, Participants lose confidence in, in the field. It's harder to recruit people. Um, for specific researchers, uh, the risks are kind of things that could affect people's careers, such as losing funding or perhaps access if they violated the terms of an agreement. Um, and then some of the privacy laws uh, themselves impose things like fines. Uh, in Europe, they've gotten more serious and have, got, uh, in some cases, at least in theory, provide for criminal or penal sanctions. There was um, Actually, some Google Italy executives were sentenced to six months in jail for a violation in a certain case there, although I think uh, 
they ultimately ended up working that out in some other way and avoiding actually going to jail, but initially it looked like it was going that way. This was a few years ago. Um, and so the other, the other kind of difficulty with researcher is that these novel risks make it harder to get informed consent, because in general you have to inform participants of all the risks that can be out there, but some of these become more and more far-flung and hard to predict in advance when data is being shared all over the world. Um, and then the other risk that happens is that when regulation is, like we were talking about, overly cumbersome, difficult to comply with, um, sometimes not thought out that well, it can stall research. So this is kind of the balance, and it kind of will tie into the next um, section that I've got here, which is kind of some other flip side of obligations that exist increasingly on researchers, which are kind of open data, which I talked before about is uh, kind of more a movement, but it's also increasingly becoming an obligation. And so, but, but I guess this existed since at least less uh, coercively since the start of kind of the genomics revolution, where as early on as 1993 in the Human Genomics, uh, Human Genome Project, uh, there were guidelines kind of put out essentially recognizing the kind of public character of genomic data and the idea that, uh, especially given uh, so the fact that public funding was largely funding the Human Genome Project and that uh, things were quite expensive, uh, that data reuse was really key and that there should be incentives and maybe even obligations on researchers to share their data as widely as possible. Uh, and so there was a number of um, of kind of guiding documents that came out around this. Some of the, I got some of the early key ones here, the 1996 Bermuda Principles, uh, but these have kind of continued over time. And so, for example, at the NIH in the US, um, they've had a series of genomic data sharing policies. The most recent iter large iteration was in 2014. Uh, and in Canada, uh, the tri-agency has their own open access policy on publications. Um, so I've got a kind of link to it here. And so some of the main things that are involved are that you know, not only do you have to ensure that your publications, obviously, this stuff is probably well known to you, publications are available through uh, open access sites, but also you have to deposit your kind of molecular data, etc. cetera. Uh, and I'll also note that there's an obligation to retain data sets for a minimum of five years, um, which I'll come back to it pretty soon. Um, and so some of the main issues, the main principles around genomic data sharing are things like releasing data rapidly, like I just mentioned, publishing in open access journals, respecting publication embargoes. So from this again goes back to kind of the early days. Eighteen minutes left. Okay, so I'm not going to get through all my slides, but I'll try to. Uh, sorry, I'll try to highlight some things. So essentially, um, there's a bit of a conflict here between. Uh, Open, the principle of open data, so the, the, if we look at kind of a definition of open data, the idea is that um, the data should be, to, to comply, the data should be provided as a whole, it should be free to use, free to use for any purpose, and the redistribution should be free, um, which kind of is the polar opposite of a lot of the techniques used to protect uh, privacy, and so uh, often we won't provide data as a whole, especially identifying information we'll, av we'll avoid sending out will impose restrictions on the way it can be used, uh, on the purpose it can be used for, and not allow a person to redistribute. So there's a the real tension that's come to come to the fore recently, I think, between these kind of conflicting obligations that unfortunately researchers are going to be subjected to, uh, or are already being so. And one of the examples, in the, in the previous talk there was mention of um, this new project um, from the Chan Zuckerberg Foundation, the Human Cell Atlas, that I've been kind of uh, involved in more and less tangentially. And so this is an example, I think, where this came to the fore, where the European Commission is funding the project under kind of the, the science research funding arm of the European Commission. They insisted um, that the data from the project be made available open access through kind, of, through kind of an open science principle. And on the other hand, the data protection supervisors uh, kind of arm of the European Commission, at one of the meetings, there was a representative who said, Oh, if you if you do that, if you put all your participants' data freely available on the internet, uh, we're going to take you to court and sue you and stop you from doing that. Which is a bit of an awkward uh, position for the uh, the project to be in, where two arms of the same organization, one of which is funding it and one of which is an enforcement agency, are telling it uh, not to do you know telling it contradictory things. Uh, and so I think this highlights some of the tensions. So. Um, Next section is kind of how do we address some of these uh, conflicting concerns. Uh, the previous kind of approach, or the dominant previous approach until kind of five or ten years ago was really this idea that, uh, and I kind of alluded to it already before a few times, that anonymizing or de-identifying data was the way 
if essentially if we remove the kind of sensitive bits of people's information, their names, it's um, you know birth dates, other identifying information, there's no real sensitivity left for the people involved in the data, and we can still use the underlying kind of uh, medical or health portions of the data to be able to do the research that we want to do. Um, and this is kind of reflected in in uh, the frameworks I was talking about by kind of differentiating between, I, this is a very American term, personally identifying information. Uh, we, in Canada, we tend to say personal information. and In Europe, they say personal data. Uh, and they, these frameworks tend to only apply to basically personal information. And there's, there's an implication that there's some other non-identifying information or you can anonymize information so that uh, it falls outside of the scope and you no longer have these obligations. Like in the context I was talking about of the common rule where it says that uh, you know, genomic, uh, even rich genomic data without uh, identifiers is not considered human subjects research. Um, so I'll skip through for time purposes. I'm probably going to end up skipping through quite a few slides now. Um, but over the last 15 to 20 years, we found that some clever people have come up with a lot of um, novel ways to kind of re-identify information that was thought to have been uh, de-identified. So in one case, you know, removing name and address, et cetera, as long as they included, in this is in the U.S., people's zip code, birth date, and sex, uh, they found they were able to re-kind of um, basically re-identify or, or combine this with other data, this, this de-identified medical data with data in a voter list to figure out who people were. Who people were. Uh, and I believe it was something like upwards of almost 90% of people were uniquely identified by their zip code, birth date, and sex. So you might think that this is pretty, you know, uh, general information, but it ends up being quite identifying. And so basically, this there's been a real loss of confidence in de-identification. In some circumstances, it's still very important, but as a general kind of solution to these problems, um, essentially there's been much less, there's much less confidence in this. So as far as DNA, um, the thinking went so far to even include this, and as I was saying, it seems as though in the, in the US they're often still thinking this way. Um, there's been papers on this. But there's been a string of kind of uh, published, at least the theoretical re-identification attacks. One of the big ones was uh, the Homer paper in 2008, which surprised people quite a bit by showing that even aggregates, uh, kind of public published uh, statistical aggregates of genomic data, uh, if you had someone else, someone's uh, kind of DNA who was a participant, you could actually tell whether they were a case or a control, and so you could actually tell whether they had the disease in question or not. Uh, and so this kind of sent a bit of a, a shockwave through the field at the time, and it's what led to the U.S. Uh, dbGaP database, which was formerly fully open, suddenly became controlled access. Um, and there's arguments still about whether they kind of overreacted in making that big change, but they haven't kind of stepped back from it since then. Uh, I'll highlight quickly a couple others. So the Gimrek paper in, paper in 2013 was one of the first that kind of went, was another thing that people thought could not be done, but with only kind of DNA and trace amounts of other data, they were able to actually come up with certain people's names. The idea, the idea was really that how can you get to figure out who someone is with just their DNA. Um, and then the, more, the most recent here, Kai, I mean, it's not that recent anymore, but uh, the 2015 paper was essentially showing there's high identifiability even based on 25 randomly s selected s SNPs um, in certain contexts. So you only need a small number of base pairs to basically uh, be able to identify someone. Um, as part of our briefs, I put a, a short brief on this issue. I'll skip kind of this one. Um, this is just a quick snippet of a paper where they're trying to react to kind of this, this reality to figure out what to do next. And so uh, these researchers were proposing that there's certain, certain areas of this whole kind of uh, genomics pipeline or research pipeline uh, that we need to figure out whether Whenever technical solutions can exist, it's probably preferable to use them was their hypothesis, which I think is, is pretty compelling. But in some cases, there just aren't technical solutions to protect them. So, so for example, when the data is coming off the sequencing machine, we can't really encrypt the data or do anything to protect it there. So we probably need legal protections. Elsewhere, maybe not. So they're putting forward some ideas here. It's still something that the field is grappling with. I'm going to skip this whole case study. Uh, there's been a few different kind of technological methods that have come have, have attempted to come up with kind of a replacement for uh, what we thought anonymization might be able to do in the past. So far, there's, there's a few that have been quite promising. Um, in the cloud context, homomorphic encryption in particular, I find really amazing. I'm not sure if people encountered it, but the idea is you can store, it, it's almost perfectly suited to the cloud context where you can store encrypted patient data in the cloud. So you're, if you say you don't trust your cloud service provider, but you want to be able to use their resources, uh, the data can be encrypted there, and you can actually send 
encrypted inst analysis instructions into the cloud. Uh, so through the magic of homomorphic encryption, which I don't uh, purport to understand, I'll try to read a few mathematical papers on it. Uh, you can actually, perf the provider can perform the encrypted operations on the encrypted data and return an encrypted result without ever understanding the data it's processing. And so from that context of the, we looked at the start of the researcher on their laptop working in the cloud, it makes a lot of sense. Unfortunately, um, it hasn't scaled, although there's been tons of proofs of concept, it so far hasn't scaled super well to very large um, applications. Uh, I've got a few others here. So the kind of the main approach um, that's, I mean, there's a kind of a, 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 a bit of a, a menu of approaches that have been arisen, arisen in response. But one of the main ones is this controlled access versus open access kind of dichotomy. So this is looking specifically at the ICGC project again. And so the idea here was there's certain types of data that we probably think are not sensitive or are not identifiable enough that it's still safe to keep them open access, to have them freely available to everyone. But there's a lot of other types of, of, of data that are more identifying um, or are um, more sensitive that we, for now, are gonna ask researchers to submit an application to uh, a data access committee to, uh, to use only in, uh, kind of in accordance with the agreement that they'll end up signing. And so for ICGC, I'll go through quickly. Um, if you want to get access to kind of the ICGC PCOG data, or uh, I believe, I guess it's specifically that. Um, there's an access form you can fill out pretty easily online through their website. Um, you can create an account, um, and then you've essentially got to put, put in some basic information about uh, the, principal, the investigators, the people who have access to the data, title of your project, um, um, a short description of the project. I, I believe you have to submit if whether you have uh, whether you require or have ethics review, um, and then uh, when and if you're approved, you uh, agree to the data access agreement, which has um, kind of a bunch of different requirements, including not trying to re-identify the data, um, using appropriate safeguards, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it, the agreement actually includes uh, kind of a number of documents that you kind of undertake to follow, including ICGC guidelines they put out uh, in 20, 2008 that they link to, uh, certain privacy and security guidelines um, that will talk about kind of what forms of kind of, uh, you know, everything from, you know, firewalls to uh, all the kind of network security stuff that you might imagine. Uh, and then as well, they also include these kind of data sharing obligations uh, in some of the, and I think they specifically point to later Fort Lauderdale and Toronto principles. Uh, oh, as well as some intellectual property stuff. Sorry? Yeah, it's, it's unencrypted it's especially. Um, and so there's a bit of a report back that was done. If I have a few minutes, I might, I might like to just quickly end talking about, this might seem a bit further afield. I'm not sure if people read about this scandal, kind of data, data security scandal that happened about two years ago with this uh, credit reporting company called Equifax. And again, this does get further from obviously the genomic data, uh, genomic research context, but I think was helpful because just recently in the last few months, the Office of the Privacy Commissioner of Canada put out some decisions based on complaints about there was a, a breach that essentially happened in 2017 that was in the media a fair bit. Um, and it's the first time I've really seen, even though they're kind of linked, the kind of privacy spheres and the data security spheres have people with different expertise in them that don't necessarily talk to each other. It's not even so much they disagree, but they're just really separate. And so it's been hard to understand even what your legal obligations are around information security and information technology. The laws, like the GDPR, et cetera, will often just say it's your obligation to have uh, you know, appropriate safeguards in place and leave it at that, which is in one way thankful because, you know, if lawyers are setting the data, you know, the, the information technology safeguards, it's probably not ideal. And plus things are moving so quickly that if you really encode them in law, it's going to be a problem. But if you want to have any idea what your obligations are, it does become pretty tricky. But I do think that this, this recent decision from the, uh, the Privacy Commission in the Equifax case moves things forward. So just to say something about the breach, it was kind of considered, uh, it was mocked a bit um, because it was kind of a cascade of failures. Everything went wrong here from, um, it essentially arose from a small vulnerability and a small piece of software added on to the Apache web server called Apache Strut that wasn't patched properly by the IT security team. There weren't proper methods in place. And then somehow that vulnerability was breached by attackers who were able to somehow gain access to this 
file share, which is essentially like a Dropbox that it turned out was being shared by between uh, Equifax Canada and Equifax US and, and others that had a whole bunch of data that I think they were just conveniently sending it to each other. Uh, and then it cascaded into like, they put up a web page where you could put in your information to see if you were subject to the breach or if your data was included in the breach or not. But essentially 95% of the times it would say we you may have been affected, so it gave you no information, but there was something about the way it was implemented, if I remember being properly, allowed fishers to generate a parallel site that looked like the Equifax site, and they were getting people to put in their information there, and everything kind of went wrong from start to finish. So in any case, um, this recent decision I'll end on quickly, um, I think it's helpful in because it, it, and obviously if you're, you know, say you're a sole researcher running from your laptop in your basement, you're a master's student or something, you're not going to be held to the same standard that Equifax, like a giant credit reporting agency is. But as, um, as the size of projects you're involved in increase, they could get closer. And the sensitivity of the data could be similar, right? Genomic data can be quite similar as we talked about before. Uh, but the other thing is this just gives you an idea of the kinds of things I think that regulators are going to be looking at. Uh, and then it might be good to have on your radar, but you can kind of scale them down to what you think. I mean, this is obviously not legal advice, but in general, I think uh, an approach is to scale them down to um, uh, the, essentially your operations. And so some of the things they were looking at um, were, as far as safeguards, um, one was vulnerability management. So this is the idea that there should be systems in place to make sure that, you know, you're always getting the updates to run on your computer. Um, often those include security upgrades if you're not running them. Uh, this is what happened with the Equifax vulnerability. In fact, an email went to the, was sent, I think, to the IT department saying, please patch this vulnerability. Uh, it wasn't done and it was left, uh, the vulnerability was there for months. Um, some people were blaming this. Um, there was an attempt, I think, especially by the company to blame this one, you know, rogue employee. But the, the consensus was really, if you're a company this large, you should have robust systems in place and not just rely on an email to one person to make sure that, uh, something this critical uh, is unpatched. Uh, network segregation, again, this is one that might be less relevant if you're a person looking, working alone on your laptop, but as, you, as people start to work in international consortia, um, the general principle is kind of the, what they call in IT security, the principle of least privilege, that only the people who kind of need to know basis, you should se separate different pieces of sensitive information to people who need them, Make sure you can't actually access one from the other. This is kind of what happened with the, the kind of Dropbox between the two organizations that kind of let everything out of the bag. Um, basic information security practices in this case were found not to be there. In this case, they specifically point to the, the existence of this kind of uh, file share that was set up to kind of facilitate things, but kind of did a bit of an end run on security practices or security protections that were in, in place. Uh, but in general, I mean, these things you'll find in the ICGC uh, agreement to things like things like prop setting up proper firewalls, things that become more more important in kind of the virtual machine context to making sure you don't have stray services running that you don't need. Um, and then the other one that was important here was oversight. So even uh, there was a bunch of things that they found that so even though there were actually in some cases proper policies set in place, no one had actually followed up to make sure they had been implemented properly. Um, and so the two things that they suggest here that are also, I think, in the GE4GH, the Global Alliance's uh, privacy and security policy, um, I'll skip here, were um, so make, doing internal and external security assessments. And so um, one thing they seem to say is that, so there's an ISO certification, ISO 2701, that they said this is probably actually appropriate for our purposes, and Equifax actually did have this. That was kind of the ex external security assessment, but the internal security assessment should have been happening more often, and there are, it's it, also important to note here, there are actually ISO health informatics, uh, certain health informatics security uh, certifications so that those might be more relevant to your work. Um, and then, all, but aside from that, even apart from the assessments, uh, they uh, insisted on also on uh, pen testing or penetration testing, which is kind of the opposite end of the spectrum where rather than looking at the system to see what's there, I mean, in a sense, it's still looking at the system that's there, but you kind of simulate an attack. You get people using what are known to be current kind of um, information security attacks to try to get into your system, try to, to carry out various breaches, see what they can do, uh, and see anything, anything that's vulnerable. Uh, retention was another issue. Uh, the idea was you shouldn't be retaining the data for beyond the amount of time you need it. From the, the DACO kind of context, usually the agreement will tell you how long you need to retain people's data in your context, although it can run up against, I mentioned before, the the tri council statement saying you have to retain data for at least five years, so if you should make sure your data sharing uh, obligations don't conflict with your other retention obligations and make sure to uh, 
uh, retain data for the appropriate period. Um, and then the last kind of issue, or the second last issue they brought up was um, accountability for international data sharing between Equifax Canada and uh, Equifax Inc. in the US, uh, which again might be relevant if you're involved in a consortium. How are you ensuring that you're still accountable for the data that's shared elsewhere? Uh, and then the kind of the last main issue that they brought up was um, issues around consent. Um, and this was especially consent to data sharing. Uh, and so in the context here, um, essentially a lot of this is carried out when you, if you're doing, uh, if you're asking for a data access committee for access, they'll be looking at whether the consents are gonna be used in compliance. But it is important for the reasons uh, I said before to make sure in general that the, that the consents were, that were obtained from, from participants are the same, uh, you know, match up with what you're doing with their data. And so, um, I mean, for now, I did have a couple other brief sections, but I think just in the interest of time, maybe I'll wrap it up now if that makes sense. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to talk more after as well. But thanks, um, thanks very much for your attention.